visit the WOCA website at www.woca.com. Ocala's Information Station, 1370 WOCA. Ocala! Five minutes before 11 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in this Monday morning. You know, as David Letterman is, is ending his um, career as a talk show host, he he's, has guests on and they'll be talking about how many times they've been on. I mean, everybody seems to know how many times they were on, but I, we always lose track of how many times we have the same guest on. <laughs> uh, return visits are always welcome. And what happens for us is you get to feel like you know the people who you've spoken to. Um, sometimes you click right away. I think that's what happened with us with uh, Sue Monk Kid. She's been on before. Uh, you might remember the Secret Life of Bees. She was on to talk about that. Not only that, but she knows Arlene Alda, right? Yep. Uh, and Arlene was on with us not too long ago. Um, so anyway, Sue Monk Kid has a new book. It's called The Invention of Wings. A uh, fascinating book about that has connections with historic, historical characters, real historical characters. Uh, Sue Monk Kidd serves on the Writers' Council for Poets and Writers. She's an award-winning New York Times bestselling author, as I just hinted at. She's an essayist and the recipient of the People's Choice Award for Best Movie and the NAACP Image Award for the Best Picture based on her award-winning book, The Secret Life of Bees. So let's talk to her now about this one, The Invention of Wings, and welcome her back to this program. Let's start keeping track of how many times our guests are with us. Okay. So when we retire, <laughs> we can say, you know, how many times. That's right. Uh, Sue, good morning, Sue. Good morning, Larry, Robin. It is nice to be back. I've lost count, too. Yeah. Where, where are you right now? Where are you calling from? Portland, Oregon. Portland. You so got up early. Earlier here. Yes, you got up very <laughs> early. Wow. Thank you for doing that. Um, you, you have a way of taking a story and... And connecting us to something that is real. I don't know how else to say that. And that's what you've done with this one. I mean, you, these are things that we all feel. You, you connect somehow with our feelings. Well, that's great to know because that's my greatest hope is that I will actually, uh, the story will actually connect with the, right, the reader's not just their mind, but their heart, and have an emotional reaction or response. And I, th I think sometimes, you know, we have this we have this gut understanding of right, the difference between right and wrong. And sometimes we, as a society, and probably as individuals as well, we've gone along with what was wrong because what was wrong was socially acceptable. But in our gut, we knew that it was wrong. And, and to see something be made right is like a really good feeling. <laughs> exactly. I, I, I'm trying to <laughs> dance around the, the, the book, but, but you understand what I'm talking about, right? Yes, I think I do. Um, you know, the book takes us back to the very uh, heart of, of American slavery, and that's where the roots of racism in America lie. And, you know, to go back there and look at that and then to see characters who are really yeah. struggling against that, I, I think there is a little bit of redemption in it, maybe. Are you there? Did I lose you? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> okay. Uh, you have uh, two interesting characters, the uh, uh, two ladies, and uh, it's really, really amazing to me how you are so accurate in your historical facts, and yet they're not dry. They're very, very much alive. Well, I was so thrilled when I actually discovered Sarah and Angelina Grimke. Um, I did not know of them until I sort of stumbled upon them in the Brooklyn Museum. And I was living in Charleston, South Carolina at the time, and this is where Sarah and Angelina Grimke are from. They were born into a wealthy slave-holding family in the early 19th century, and they accomplished the most amazing things, and yet they fell through this crack in history. And I had to go all the way from Charleston to New York to find out about them. And when I did, I was really captivated by their lives. Um, they kind of took my breath, actually, their bravery and what they did. And I was, it was mind-boggling to me why we didn't know about them. I, I sort of felt like they should be household names. Yeah. Um, 
and and yet we we miss them I, I meet few people as I travel around who really know of them so it was just a really uh, a thrill for me to decide to do the novel and to try to help people uh, rediscover or discover their who they are so was you your interest in the the Grimke sisters the the genesis of this story or did you stumble upon them because the story had already started to develop no I wasn't really looking for a novel idea at the time I went to the museum I was working on a book, I, a memoir I was writing with my daughter, Ann Kid Taylor, called Traveling with Pomegranates. And I was wandering in the museum and I saw their names on a heritage panel at the Judy Chicago Dinner Party exhibit. And they were listing these names of women who'd made contributions to Western history. There were 999 of them that go all the way back to antiquity. And there were these two sisters. And, you know, it really brought me up short because. Um, as I said, they were from Charleston, and I had missed them. And it, I think it speaks to how sometimes we just lose important stories and figures in American history, particularly sometimes if they are women. And um, I, that's how the novel began. It was the inspiration for it, because I was really swept away by their lives and what they did. I wonder, I wonder why that is, um, that you ladies, you know, I think us guys have these huge egos, and so we make sure everything's in stone. <laughs> I mean, sometimes <laughs> literally in stone. We, we have sculptors do, you know, renderings of us, you know, but you're right. I mean, we, we have shortchanged you ladies in, in recognizing the contributions. D did, you, um, did you choose to make it a novel as opposed to just simply writing a book about the two sisters? Yes, I mean, that's what I do. You know, I'm a storyteller and a fiction writer, as well as a memoirist. And I'm not a historian or a biographer, and I had to come to terms with that. I mean, Sarah and Angelina Grimke were the first female abolition agents in America. They took this a tremendous crusade out on the road uh, for anti their anti-slavery views at a time when there was a great deal of backlash against them. And they were also women's rights pioneers. And I would even argue that they are the mothers of women's rights in this country because they sort of lit the first sparks about all of that. And, and so, you know, they did such amazing things and I wanted to acknowledge that in the novel as well. And the views are most incredible. Uh, one of the views was when they're having a conversation uh, one lady had said to the other one, my body might be a slave but my mind's not but yours is the other way around. Yes, that um, really encapsulates so much of what this novel is about, I think. There are two narrators in the novel. One is Sarah Grimke, who tells this story of how she went from this wealthy slave-holding family to be this, um, this advocate, this reformer, this fiery person who stood by slaves. And the other is a character that is fictional, that I sort of invented, who is I named Hetty Handful. She's an enslaved woman, and their lives are intertwined. But this is what Handful, Hetty Handful, says to Sarah one day. My body might be a slave, but not my mind. For you, it's the other way round. And um, I, I think that does speak to something in... That's very in, profound. Well, you know, she had to free her mind and her heart, her spirit, her voice and kind of step up to be, come to herself and to find her own awareness and consciousness in the world in order to do what she did. And so the book is really trying to look at two quests for freedom. One, literally, to find freedom from slavery, and the other, to find an internal freedom. Do you know, this is going to, my next question is going to reveal something that most people seem to know, and I don't think I understand it. But here's the question, and the question comes with a little bit of thinking that I know the answer, just kind of give myself a little, I'm preparing people to stop and call me stupid, but <laughs> did, did this, when, when slavery was around, did the slaves take on the surname of their owners? They did, um, almost always. Uh, it was um, the, the, the so-called owners would name slaves, had that right of naming, which is, you know, 
a very fundamental and profound right to name your own child. But yes, they were taken in and given their last ho- name. Okay, the whole name or just the last name? Well, sometimes both. Almost always they took the surname. I don't. I saw some instances where um, slaves, of course, when they were freed, um, reverted to other names, and some did not. But most all slaves took the surname, and even sometimes, in the case that I tried to show in my novel, they even named their first name. So is is the Grimke name a, a, a common name? I don't. It's like not a very common name that I know of. Like Jackson is a very common name, and mm-hmm. Andrew Jackson was a slave owner, right? Yes. Um, the Grimke name in Charleston is fairly well known, but they were um, a, a family of lawyers. Uh, Sarah's father was a, a wealthy judge, was actually on the highest, um, what would be equivalent to the state Supreme Court. He was uh, a politician, a legislator, and he helped to, f- to form some of the slave laws in South Carolina. So you can begin to get a vision of just what she was up against. Is that what you... Is that where you grew up? I grew up in Georgia. In Georgia, yes, okay. I'm a I'm a Southern girl. Yeah, uh, uh, well, South uh, Georgia. Uh, and did that affect having grown up in the South? And whatever whatever remnants of attitude were still here in the South, um, did that affect you at all? Well, of course. Um, I think that I was my own consciousness was very much shaped by what I witnessed growing up. I came of age in the 50s and 60s. I was a little girl in the 50s in a tiny town in in Georgia. And, you know, pre-Civil Rights South. So I witnessed a lot of uh, racial divides and racial cruelties, and it had a very deep and lasting effect on me, which is why I keep revisiting, I think, this particular theme of race and race relations and civil rights and slavery. And you know, it, it never occurred to me about urban slavery. I never, it never even, I never even gave it a thought. I, uh, when you think of urban slavery, you know what you picture? You picture like the housemaid in, in like uh, Gone with the Wind or something. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I, I believe you'll conjure up even a plantation field or a you know, cotton field or something. Um, but urban slavery was very prevalent in the t- cities in America, in the colonies. And I, I don't think we understand exactly, at least I didn't understand, how um, that operated, how a system like that worked. It's very different from plantation slavery. They were not just house servants in these palatial mount, uh, mansions in Charleston, but there were slaves that were really doing the backbone work of the city, that were making the whole city work. They were working on the docks. They were in the streets. They were transportation. They sold vegetables. I mean, it was a very different look. And and you give the reader something tangible to hold on to, as well as the characters in the form of a quilt. Yes, the the so-called slave quilt. Um, I wanted there to be... um, a visual way for my characters to tell their story, the enslaved characters. And so they were seamstresses in, in the story. H- um, handful, Hetty Handful. I should go back and say Hetty was the, the master named her Hetty, but her mama named her Handful. So <laughs> I can't her. This is where the name Handful comes from because she was premature. So she was just a handful of a baby. Oh, okay. But, wow. <laughs> But, yes, um, Hetty Handful was, um, remind me of the question, I, I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> about the, uh, 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 about uh, she was preserving history by creating a quilt. Oh, the quilt, yes. Yeah, see, I shouldn't chase a rabbit like that. Um, the quilt was something that these two women, Hetty Handful and her mother, wanted to um, tell their story through. So they stitched it into a cloth. I think we all have this very strong need to tell our stories and to have our stories witnessed by others. And this is the purpose of the quilt. It's a very healing thing to tell your story and to, and to put it in a quilt seemed a way to really have it tangible. 
And that leads to the quote Robin pointed out to me. We had Arlene Alda on. She was talking about her book, Just Kids from the Bronx, and she used one of your quotes from The Secret Life of Bees. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with that, right? The fact that she used your quote? No, I'm not. Oh, That's you didn't know it? Oh, wow. It's in, it's in Arlene Alda's book. She, uh, in the very front. She, she quotes you. She says, stories have to be told or they die. And when they die, we can't remember who we are or why we're here. And she, of course, credits you for, for that quote. Well, that's lovely, yes. She's uh, Alan Alda's wife. Oh, very nice. Okay, I'll have to look into that. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I, I can't believe we're letting you know something you didn't know. <laughs> yeah, your, your quote... Okay. Isn't you would be amazed at what I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I ask you to hold on just a little bit? We have to check the weather and get a couple of commercials in, and we'll be right back, okay? Uh, sure. S- Sue Monkhead, you're such a joy to have on the show with us. You'll, we'll be right back with Sue when we come back. Her new book is called The Invention of Wings. We'll be right back. The weather is brought to you by MyFWC.com. Safe boating is no accident. Times of clouds and sun today with a shower or thunderstorm in the area, mainly during the afternoon hours over the interior, the high 85. To 89. Partly cloudy tonight, though 68 to 72. Clouds and some sun tomorrow with a shower or thunderstorm in the afternoon, high 87 to 91. And on Wednesday, intervals of clouds and sun with an afternoon thunderstorm likely, high 89 to 93. From the Florida Weather Center, I'm meteorologist Joe Lundberg. Black Cow Composted Cow Manure is a terrific organic soil amendment. We start with cow manure from dairy farms and then compost it a full 90 days. The result is an all-natural, dark, rich soil amendment that's great for everything you grow. Flowers, vegetables, shrubs, trees, and lawns, too. Look for Black Cow in the bright yellow and black bag at your favorite nursery or garden center. Black Cow, the mature manure. Black Cow. Hi, Matt Wilkerson here, your mobile Verizon rep. But not just here, I'll deliver the phone to you in your home. While I'm there, I'll only sell you what you need and I'll personalize it to you. Want to have me get you connected? Then call me at 352-528-0020. I even offer unlimited home phone service for just $20 per month. Just call me, your mobile Verizon rep, at 352-528-0020. Wow, I can't believe what I'm seeing. Who did this? PB Tiki's and more, of course. Now I have a Tiki Hut for shade, and I can enjoy the sounds of my cascading fountain while feeding my koi fish in my own pond. They even fixed my fence and redid all my landscaping. Nice to see a professional, reliable, family-owned business. Yes, PB Tiki's is the natural Florida tiki builder and water features designer. With free estimates, PB Tiki's is licensed and insured. Call 352-877-3307 for your very own Tiki Hut and more. That's 352-877-3307. PB Tiki's. All right, seven minutes before 11 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. Part part of what I wanted to make sure I mentioned during this conversation has to do with the way we think about people who are of different groups than ourselves. And and the best way I can do this is with this story. Uh, So I went to the grocery store one time, and I came out of the grocery store, and and I said to Robin that, um, oh, I had this funny conversation with the cashier. She was a, a tall, young uh, black woman and, and then I told the story and then I started thinking well I wonder why I had to tell you she was a black woman why did I have to tell you she was tall why did I have to tell you she was young mm-hmm. in fact why did I even have to tell you she was a woman yeah <laughs> it, it, <laughs> it, 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 is, it is interesting that uh, like, like if it was a guy I wouldn't have said anything other than uh, the guy well, I would have said he was a guy I would have identified his, yeah. uh, his gender but I think that would have been it I don't know yeah, I think that is a really insightful because um, it's it's often invisible and hidden to us how these things happen, which is exactly what's going on in the invention of wings. This um, whole matter of slavery was so somehow in, hidden to people, or at least they rendered it hidden and invisible. And we have these things happening today, which I suppose is why I believe history historical fiction is really relevant to us. Very relevant. Yeah, oh yes. I mean, William Faulkner said the, the past isn't dead. It isn't even past. And we really continue a lot of this kind of invisibility in our lives. One of them is probably what you were just pointing to that is very subtle, isn't it? And we seem to think that um, 
we are the center and everything else is the other. You know, yes, yes. We're the default and that's the center point of the world and then the, the rest are somehow have to be described as other than us or even valued less in that sense. But there's a line in the Invention of Wings at the end that I, I really wanted to address this in just a line if I could. Yeah. And it was put in, I put it in the mouth of Sarah, who at the very end of the novel says, whiteness isn't sacred. We can't go on defining everything by whiteness. And that's simply a matter of just taking it out of the center. And as in The Secret Life of Beasts, my character says, why can't we just all be colorless together? <laughs> and of course, we can preserve our traditions and our culture and still do that at the heart. And and that is just so, so insightful of you, because when the two ladies got together, they were children. They were 10 and 11, and you have different perspectives as a child and as an adult, and they grew up over the 30-some years in your book, which is very fascinating to me, because each age had their own share of struggles. It wasn't just limited to one. No, exactly. And, you know, both Sarah and and heady handful uh they have a very hard time trying to form a relationship across this huge gap of mistress and enslaved person and you know heady handful was given to sarah when sarah was a girl they were both girls together and that was an uneasy relationship and i hope there's relevance in that too of the honesty of that relationship of trying to reach across and find bridges and ways to meet each other at the at the center. When you when you're writing a historical novel like this and you're creating some fictional scenes and some and some fictional people or partially fictional people, and you're doing research to do it all, do you do you ever have anybody who um, we we could look up. Is is are, are there names in the book that we could look up and say, oh, that's the person? Like like in the Titanic movie, mm -hmm. some of the people oh, in the Titanic movie were actual people that you could look up. Yeah. Now, you couldn't look up the two main characters, but did you have people in your book that we could look up? Oh, indeed, um, you could look up quite a lot of characters in the Invention of Wings. I mean, of course, as we've already said, Sarah and Angelina Grimke were real figures. Um, but there are many others, too, like Denmark Vesey, who was an, a free black man in Charleston at the time, who plotted a huge a slave insurrection. And that story of that insurrection is um, rather significant in the novel. There's Lucretia Mott, who was a women's rights pioneer. She's a minor character. And Theodore Weld, a great abolitionist orator is in the novel. I mean, there are a number of um, real figures who were part of that Denmark V.C. slave insurrection. I mean, I could go on and on. It's a rather long list of real characters that you... And I tried very hard to blend fact and fiction and to give a sense of what was really going on at that time. You know what's interesting, too? When you say he was a free black man, um... There was a song by Randy Newman, and Randy Newman says they're free to be put in a cage in Harlem in New York City. They're free to be put in a cage. And he talks about all the different neighborhoods that we kind of confined African Americans to at one time and probably still do to a certain extent. It, it's interesting that free isn't as free as we think free is, you know? It's oh, you're exactly right. Um, there's freedom and there's freedom. You know, they were called free black simply because they were they right. had been yeah. but there was little real freedom in it. And this goes also for women. I mean, this was absolutely the thing that Sarah and Angelina did as well. They were the ones who linked women's rights and abolition, and they discovered that, wait a minute, we're out here fighting for slaves to be freed, but we're also experiencing a, a, a form of slavery ourselves. We have absolutely no rights at yeah. all. Yeah. And they, they were really um, prevented from speaking in the public sphere, which is what got their back up and caused them to really launch their women's rights campaign. You are an amazing writer, uh, Sue Monk Kidd, and a great guest. Yes. I love these interviews with you. 
uh, The Invention of Wings. Call me if you want the copy that was sent to us. You can have the one that was sent to us. The rest of us have to go buy it. We've got about 10 seconds. Do you have a website? Yes, asumonkkid.com. Easy enough. Sue Monk Kid with two Ds. Uh, thank you so much, Sue. Anytime, come back. Absolutely. I'll look forward to it. All right. Thank yeah. you. All right. We'll be right back. It's WOCA, Ocala, Gainesville, The Villages, 1370 AM, 963 FM, The Source. News ready to go. I'm Pam Puso. Security remains tight around a restaurant in Waco, Texas, following some.